Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Life is a story we tell ourselves. My guest today is Dr. Jared Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan is a theoretical physicist with broad interest, interest in effective field theory, particle physics, cosmology, scattering amplitudes, and the conformal field theory bootstrap. His present research uses conformal field theory to learn about quantum gravity via the anti de Sitter space conformal field theory correspondence. In the last few years, he's also been collaborating with both physicists and computer scientists on machine learning research, including on scaling laws for neural models and the GTP3 language model. Today, we will discuss the nature of gravity, the curvature of space, quantum gravity, and how those things contribute to our understanding of reality. So welcome to the program, Dr. Kaplan. Great, thank you, and thanks for having me. Well, I, it's really a pleasure. I'm, I'm excited to have you here today. You know, we're gonna talk a little bit about physics from the point of view that, you know, physics started out uh, with people wondering about life and wondering about reality, wondering about spirit, purpose, and meaning, um, you know, of course, which gave birth to uh, natural philosophers and then from natural philosophy in, ensued, you know, the scientific method and, and physics. And so I, it leads me to, to be curious about, you know, you and uh, why you became a theoretical physicist in the first place. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm one of those people who's been really excited about and fascinated by physics from a pretty early age. Um, I was always interested in, in math and I always uh, liked learning math with my dad. Um, I remember the first time I learned that you could write really, 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 really big numbers using exponential notation. And my dad explained to me uh, while we were waiting for dinner at a restaurant that you could multiply two times two and then two times two times two times two, et cetera. And you could, you could re represent numbers that were as big as the number of stars in the sky, that kind of thing. So I was always excited about math and its relationship with, uh, uh, with the physical world. Um, and that was very inspiring. Um, I think then also I was very interested in kind of more philosophical questions about what the world really is. I guess if you had amnesia and you just kind of woke up here in the world, you might ask, well, what is this place? Where am I? What's going on here? And I think uh, it's natural to continue to ask those questions uh, uh, in the, about this world that we all find ourselves in. Um, another particular memory I have is when I was 13 or 14, I remember I realized that I didn't know whether free will was possible or not. And hmm. I, I didn't necessarily had it, have the most sophisticated conception of free will, but I wanted to know, was it the case the laws of physics were fully deterministic, meaning that me and my brain were all uh, just moving forward through time like, uh, like clockwork in, uh, in the way that it's often discussed in classical physics? Or... Um, was there some room for choice? Was there some room for randomness? And I knew there was some association of quantum mechanics with randomness, but I just sort of remember having this revelation. I just don't know. And I went, I went to the library at my school and I started looking through science books, trying to figure out what I needed to read to figure this out. So I think uh, a lot of questions like that really motivated me to, to keep on going in physics. Um, and I really just wanted to understand what the laws of physics were um, and, uh, and kind of what it meant about... Uh, about life. <clears throat> yeah. And then this le leads you to becoming ultimately a, a theoretical physicist. This will be a little bit of a digression, but um, I can't help it because you mentioned mathematics and that being something that, you know, inspired you in, in the beginning. And I remember having a, a love for mathematics as well. But then when I got to imaginary numbers, I had this complete, you know, almost meltdown. What is this? Until I read, um, Sir Roger Penrose's book, um, The Emperor's New Mind. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in that he did the most brilliant and elegant um, representation of how an understanding of probability and imaginary numbers led uh, to uh, the discovery of the strong and weak forces and how they interacted. And I like, like blew my mind, it was like magic. Uh, when I saw that, so I can like totally relate to what to what you're saying uh, with with mathematics, and I was finally cured of my frustration with imaginary numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I had a a, a more pedestrian uh, uh, moment like that as well, where when I was in high school and I was learning about circuits, um, someone told me, well, you know, like it's it's easy to understand 
uh, circuits and uh, including oscillating circuits with capacitors and, uh, uh, and, and resistors and all these sorts of components. Um, if you introduce imaginary numbers, and I remember thinking I'd heard of imaginary numbers, I knew this the basic idea, but I was kind of surprised that that was a, a place where they they find application. And of course, uh, as a theoretical physicist now, it's not surprising at all. But I mean, we all have these moments where uh, 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 <clears throat> something that seems extremely abstract and almost nonsensical actually has a lot of bearing uh, on the physical world. Yeah, it made me happy, actually. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People would think that's crazy, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So um, one of the things in, in physics that people really uh, relate to, and I get the most questions about in, in my seminars is, is gravity. And um, so there's Newton's conception of gravity. Of course, there's general relativity and Einstein's conception of gravity. And then now there's quantum gravity. But if we started with Newton, what's that conception of gravity all about? So. I'm not the, the best historian, but I can tell you how we think about it uh, in, 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 in modern language. Um, I guess the startling realization that's, that seems obvious to us now is that the same force is responsible for the celestial motion and for things falling on Earth. Um, but then more abstractly, we think about Newtonian gravity in terms of some absolute space and absolute time. And then gravity is just this force between uh, between masses, and it's just a, a one over. It's just an inverse squared force law um, between masses that's proportional to the masses of, uh, of of the different objects. Right, and so most people in the beginning, I know me as a young uh, student in graduate school, when I learned about that, I, I mean that kind of was intuitive, and it made sense uh, to me, and then. I go to advanced physics and along comes this notion of, um, of general relativity and the cur curvature of space. And then somehow Maxwell and his equations of electromagnetic fields, you know, had something to do with, you know, Einstein coming along and saying, you know, this, you know, conception of gravity is a force uh, between uh, two masses and the force being you know, uh, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, which seemed intuitive. Now we've got this other conception and where did that come from? And, and uh, why is that important in physics today? Well, um, <laughs> I, think, I think it has, it has a long history. Um, so you mentioned uh, Maxwell's equations. I think uh, <clears throat> one thing that, uh, that inspired Einstein early on, and this was before general relativity, um, in his sort of famous 1905 paper about special relativity. So there are these two relativities associated with Einstein. Special relativity is about the symmetries of, uh, of space-time. Um, but of course, in 1905, Einstein hadn't come up with general relativity. He didn't know anything about it. So it's really a statement about symmetries. And it's a statement about how the what the relationship is between symmetries that I think are very intuitive, like that the laws of physics are the same, no matter what orientation you're in. So in other words, if I'm facing east or I'm facing west, or I'm lying on my back looking up at the sky, the laws of physics are the same, no matter how I orient myself. So that's the symmetry of rotations. Um, special relativity was about, uh, was about uniting the symmetry of rotations with another maybe less intuitive symmetry, which is that if I'm running, and you're stationary, I see the same laws of physics as you. And uh, what Einstein noticed in particular was that uh, in electromagnetism, uh, electromagnetism had a different set of symmetries from what everyone assumed. It has the symmetries of Lorentz transformations. And so, so that, was, uh, that was this first inkling of uniting space and time because a consequence of this, these ideas were these very, very surprising observations like that if you're in a spaceship going <clears throat> near the speed of light, um, going so fast that you're, you're, you're approaching the speed of light, then there will be time dilation. Time won't flow the same way for you as it would for, for an external observer. And there's also these length contractions. Ob objects might appear shorter or smaller than, than they would seem. And so that was uh, that led Einstein to sort of this idea that space and time should be should be united in this, in this beautiful way uh, by this enhanced set of, of symmetries. And then um, I think it's, uh, so 
So uh, what motivated then moving on to general relativity was this idea that uh, acceleration um, and, uh, and, and falling were somehow related that uh, any freely falling observer, no matter where, where they are in a gravitational field, um, basically uh, experiences the same laws of physics uh, locally. And, uh, and so, so this, this, this was, so this led Einstein to, uh, uh, to general relativity, but it was really quite miraculous because there's a sense in which uh, an adaptation and enhancement of Newton's law of gravity could have been sort of good enough. Um, Newton's law of gravity is very, very simple. Um, it, in some sense, has a, a force field, which is just like a number everywhere. It just says, what is the gravitational force or the gravitational potential at any given point, uh, point in space? Einstein's theory of general relativity, this theory of curved space-time, um, goes, uh, goes way beyond that. Um, it has, it's a more complicated seeming theory, but it's very, very beautiful feature is that it explains why uh, uh, all different kinds of uh, objects, no matter what their, what their mass is, experience the same kinds of effective gravitational forces. Right, right and that's a lot uh, to, to, to take in. So, but that leads people to ask questions about, you know, th this notion of, you know, the curvature um, of space time and um, of course, everyone's familiar with the famous uh, experiment uh, that was uh, done during a total eclipse that uh, saw the bending of light um, around a, a nearby star that validated the notion that, that space um, itself is uh, curved. Um, so could you say a few words about what it's you know, curved by? I mean, most people know there's mass in space and there's energy in space and there's some sort of you know, pressure uh, acting upon, you know, space that produces this, uh, uh, this curvature. Um, but I think, you know, people's minds get blown when they think about looking out into space and thinking about something being curved. And so they ask, you know, well, what is it that's curving? I don't see nothing out there that's curved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a classic, uh, classic challenge of, uh, of general relativity. So yeah, the, the idea I mean, the answer to that question is that uh, if you imagine that you uh, you don't live on the globe of the Earth, but you imagine, say, an ant living on a globe that you have sitting in front of you, just a, just a just a ball or a sphere, then if you're only sort of able to move around on the surface of that uh, of that object, um, and you don't you don't have any way of getting out, you don't have any way of getting off of the surface and sort of out into the world, um, then you think that you basically just live in a two-dimensional world because there's only two different ways that you can go. Um, and all you see is the intrinsic curvature of the, that surface that you, that you, that you live on. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the kind of curvature that we, that we talk about in general relativity. And now you can abstract away. It doesn't matter whether that globe is sitting in your living room or whether it, it, it's the things that are sort of outside and inside the globe exist at all. Um, if you imagine something that could only move around in that surface, in that thin layer of the, of the surface, then that's uh, that's what we're talking about. And so the idea is that our universe isn't two dimensional; it has three spatial dimensions, and then it has has time all 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 wrapped up together. Um, but really, our universe isn't sort of curved inside something else. It's the sort of intrinsic curvature of space and time itself that uh, that that we see, um, and. What's you also asked sort of what's what's give, what's bringing the curvature? Well, there's mass as as you mentioned, and in general there's energy. And then you can imagine well, what happens if energy moves around? If energy moves around, then uh, then in different reference frames it has momentum. And if you sort of fill out all of the possibilities, basically the possibilities are spanned by uh, what what is the motion of an observer? And then how is the object being observed move, moving? So that basically requires you to specify both uh, the motion of, an, of an observer and the motion of the energy source that's moving. That basically means that you need uh, uh, 16 numbers to specify that. And physicists call those 16 numbers the energy momentum tensor. And that sort of beautifully symmetrically wraps together the energy, the mass, the momentum and the pressure that that you mentioned, and it's ultimately that uh, all of that stuff that 
uh, acts on, on space time and causes it to curve um, in general relativity. Right. And it's, um, it's something that's hard for people to, to conceptualize. And, and I was going to talk a little bit about uh, de Sitter space and anti de Sitter space, but I think that'll be a little much for some people to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to get to and conceptualize. And there, and there are so many components of that, but it's a, uh, it's a beautiful way of conceptualizing space and understanding how uh, things uh, work in space, uh, especially using those, uh, those particular uh, models. Um, so, you know, when we talk about gravity, people um, also, you know, think of it as, as something mysterious. And so out of that kind of mysterious notion, even if you talk about it in terms of general relativity, um, and even if you, uh, like I have, um, tried to understand uh, Einstein's uh, field equations and get into them in depth, it's still mysterious and beautiful. And so it gives you a, a, a it, it makes you question, you know, what's reality and how do, how do things work? So do you think that ultimately getting a grasp of, um, of gravity uh, will uh, give us a deeper understanding of reality? And then maybe you can, can work into your answer a little bit about why now we're trying to understand gravity on an even deeper level in terms of quantum mechanics and, and quantum gravity, something that you're working on? Sure. So uh, I think, um, I mean, I think, I think a lot of the progress in physics has really been uh, uniting. Um, very, very early on, um, there was Newton, as we discussed earlier, uniting the motion of the planets with, no, with the motion here on Earth. I think through uh, uh, electromagnetism, sort of electric forces and magnetic forces were combined together in one description. Then we had this uh, uh, super important a series of developments with thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, where it was realized that uh, heat was really just a form of energy. And the kind of energy that Newton was talking about in terms of motion and potential energy and gravity was just one form of energy that could be turned into many, many others. Um, in, in, including including heat, and that was responsible for the phenomena of temperature. So that was a further uniting. And then with uh, uh, quantum mechanics and and the rise of the standard model of particle physics, um, we were really able to kind of describe almost everything in reality um, using using this uh, one simple set of rules. So I think that's the way in which uh, in which physics is really dramatically demystifying in a certain way, in the sense that we can get to these simple, uh, these very, very simple, beautiful underlying theories that can explain things like, why does the periodic table of the elements in chemistry have the particular structure it has? Why do the elements behave the same, behave the way that they do? Um, how do you build a GPS satellite so that you can, uh, so you can uh, get signals anywhere on earth and sort of figure out where you are? I mean, all these different things, like GPS requires general relativity. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's very demystifying. I think the thing that's mysterious is that as we learn more and more about these fundamental laws of nature, they, uh, they really apply in regimes that are very, very far from our day-to-day -day experience. Mm -hmm. And humans evolved to deal with a particular set of environments. I mean, as humans, we can't see things that are much smaller than uh, a millimeter across. It's hard to see things that are a lot smaller than that. Um, we can't really travel further than, I mean, if we're traveling on foot, we can only travel maybe tens or hundreds of miles. Maybe if you're an adventurer, you travel thousands of miles, but that's it. So there's a certain range of environments that we really evolved to live in. And in our day-to-day -day lives, even in the modern era, there are only certain kinds of things that we encounter. And as the laws of physics, uh, begin to apply to distant scales that are vastly smaller than anything a hu the human eye can see or vastly bigger than, than any place we can travel or experience. And on time scales like the age of universe that are much longer than even human civilization lived, lives, I think the laws of physics become less intuitive for the reason that they, uh, they don't talk about the, the world, they don't conceptualize the world in familiar terms. And so I think that's a lot of what makes what makes it mysterious. The other mysterious aspect is really that there are these simple laws of physics at all. Um, right. I, I mean, from a basic point of view, I mean, like the laws of physics could have been a lot more complicated. They could have been arbitrary. There could be random events that happen that are just completely unpredictable. Um, but none of that seems to occur in our universe um, uh, as far as as far as we're aware. And, uh, and so this extreme predictability with, uh, with such simple rules, I mean, I think it's very mysterious, but 
I don't think we really have any idea why it's why it's the case. No, I, I, I know. And we could even talk about, you know, why the constants in the universe are, are what they are and, and the mass of an electron, why it is what it is. And if it was, you know, just a little bit different, we wouldn't exist. Uh, and um, so, yeah, those are the kinds of things that, um, that, that do lead to making it a, a little uh, more mysterious. But I, it, it seems to me that you're also saying that, that the physics has been able to put things together to the extent that it's demystified a lot of things. There are some fundamental my mysteries that, that really do still exist. Um, and our understanding of reality um, is still a little bit challenged because there are those um, kind of fundamental mysteries like you know the universal constants uh, that make life uh, possible in the universe. Uh, those types of things still remain uh, kind of um, outstanding. And, and so when you get down on the small level, and, and so people out there, you, you started talking about math and, uh, and using uh, numbers. Uh, and so the Planck scale uh, is like at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, if I'm not mistaken, something very, very small. And that's when you're getting to the, uh, to the quantum level. And so that's where you start talking about quantum gravity. And does gravity behave different at that level? Is it not the same? Is it totally in conflict with, with what our understanding of gravity is? So that's a great question. So, I mean, we of course are very, very far away from making doing any kind of experiments at such short distance scales. Um, but a phenomenon that's actually recurred in a lot of areas of physics is that a lot of theories of physics predict their own demise. Um, so <clears throat> there are many situations where, uh, so for so an example of this sort of classically was people were trying to think of what is an electron 100, 150 years ago. Um, and, uh, uh, and so there were these classical models of the electron as some sort of shell of charge. Um, and the shell has some size, it's just like some classical object like a ball, but it's just very small. And you cram all this charge in there. And people wondered, well, if there's all this charge at a tiny little place, it must have a lot of energy because of the repulsion of the charge against itself. And therefore it seems like something's wrong with our description of the electron, because if we keep making it small and small, it'll have bigger and bigger energy. And that was a problem. And, uh, and of course, our, our theory of physics was, was wrong in a lot of different ways at that point, but uh, it, it sort of presaged both the development of quantum mechanics and the existence of the positron. So this, this fact that you would think that the electromagnetic energy of the electron should make it, should give it a total energy, which eventually becomes much bigger than its mass, was a real problem. And it was resolved basically because quantum fluctuations of electrons and positrons together kind of cancel out this, this, this effect and leave the electron's mass fixed in quantum mechanics. So it doesn't sort of become arbitrarily heavy if it becomes an arbitrarily small point particle. So that's an example of, of, of one theory of physics kind of uh, predicting its own, uh, its own decline. And that helped lead theorists to develop uh, develop further theories and, and physics is the history of physics is littered with tons of examples like this so in general relativity the problem we face um, is that general relativity also predicts its own demise in the same way and that's where the Planck scale comes in so if you if you try to do experiments with general relativity at energies at or above the Planck scale um, then uh, and really what I mean is distances smaller than this distance scale you, you pointed out, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, um, then uh, <clears throat> general relativity appears to predict its own demise. It stops making sense. Um, one runs into singularities. One can't really do any calculations anymore. So that that is one of the classic problems with, uh, uh, with, with, with general relativity. Um, and it really, uh, if you take it very seriously, it suggests a breakdown in reductionism. So in, in physics in, in general, we've made a ton of progress by asking sort of what are the, what is, what is nature made of? What are protons made of? Well, they're made of quarks. Uh, what were atoms made of? Well, they're made of nuclei and electrons. And with gravity, because gravity breaks down in the way that it does, you actually beyond the Planck scale can't really apply reductionism to gravity. Um, the reason is that if you try to make something smaller than the Planck scale, what general relativity predicts is that you'll actually just make a black hole. 
And if you try to try to sort of build a microscope to see even smaller, you'll actually just end up with a bigger and bigger black hole. Basically, to see really tiny things, you need a lot of energy, and all that energy just collapses into a black hole. And so that's uh, that's kind of how general relativity breaks down um, when we try to probe it at the Planck scale. Hmm. And so, how are you trying to resolve that? <clears throat> Great. So, so I think the uh, uh, fortunately, these black holes that you form when you try to study gravity at very, very, very small scales um, have a lot of interesting properties that we can reason about in a, in a more classical context. So we can think about large black holes, black holes at the mass of the sun, black holes at the center of the galaxy. Um, so those kinds of black holes are so big that they're actually under control. We, we believe general relativity makes sense as a description of them to, to a very good approximation. And uh, Hawking and Bekenstein and, and Wheeler and others um, in, uh, in the 70s were thinking very hard about what, what black holes really are. How should we think about them? And they were bothered by facts like, if I take a system with a lot of information in it, like an encyclopedia, and I throw it into a black hole, is that information somehow lost forever or isn't it? And this gets back actually to, to the uh, point I made at the beginning about are the laws of physics deterministic or not? In a sense, quantum mechanics really is deterministic. The evolution of the wave function in quantum mechanics is deterministic. And what that means is that information actually can't ever be destroyed because you can always run the laws of physics forward in time or backward in time, and you get back to where you started. You don't sort of forget what happened and then and then lose track of, of, of where you are. Um, and so uh, and so it was strongly believed that uh, that say an encyclopedia thrown into a black hole somehow that information has to be there somewhere. And by thinking very carefully about this, uh, uh, these researchers came up with this idea of black hole thermodynamics that black holes actually have a characteristic entropy, which really means a characteristic number of possible configurations they can be in. And of course, they also have a famously a temperature, they uh, they radiate via Hawking radiation, uh, et cetera. And so those, those observations uh, uh, made by Hawking and Bekenstein and others in, in, the, in the 70s have really been, I think, the inspiration to a lot of progress that we've made in, in, in quantum gravity. And uh, I think one of the most promising ideas is really sort of to take this very seriously um, and uh, postulate what at first seems, seems very implausible, that there's some kind of theory of physics that is uh, uh, that describes our gravitational universe, but lives in fewer space-time dimensions. Mm -hmm. So that's this is this is called the holographic principle, um, and the the very very uh, fancy acronym you mentioned uh, when you were introducing me, the anti de Sitter conformal field theory correspondence or ADS CFT is is a, is a very concrete, direct uh, instantiation of this idea. Um, so uh, Bekenstein, when he was analyzing black holes, um, found that it seemed by far the most natural conclusion to reach was uh, that the amount of information in a black hole or the different number of configurations a black hole can be in um, is proportional to its surface area um, rather than its volume. And mm -hmm. Uh, this should be surprising because if you have a hard drive, if you say uh, fill a box with a bunch of hard drives, the bigger the box that you have, the more hard drives you can fit in the box and therefore the more information you can store. And it's the volume of that moving box that you have that governs how much information in terms of hard drives you toss into it, uh, you, can, uh, you can store. Um, it just, it just, it just, it's volume, not like the surface area of, uh, of, of this box. But Bekenstein was proposing something that seems very crazy, that uh, the total amount of information you can store in this uh, imaginary moving box is really something like the surface area of that box rather than the volume of the, of the inside of that box. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and this was very surprising and perplexing. Uh, but, but yeah, it's led to this holographic principle which suggests maybe in a fundamental way, the universe really wants to be described using something that's 
in lower dimensions. That's an area rather than a volume. So areas are two dimensional, volumes are three dimensional, and so we should we should describe our universe uh, with with a lower dimensional theory. And that's that's something that I've I've tried to work on. Oh, are, are you kind of saying we we did a seminar on this not long ago um, here in my uh, community, and uh, so on a the universe <clears throat> uh, is uh, four dimensional with three dimensions of uh, space and, and one of time. And so you're saying maybe in a lower dimension, maybe two dimensions or solely three dimensions, there's information um, that exists that somehow gets projected onto, or I don't know, foliated is the right word, but um, into this, um, into our dimension. And then um, what we see as, as existence comes about is this information that's stored in, in this low in this lower dimension. And that's a holographic principle. Um, because most people think of holograms as Princess Leia being projected onto the screen saying, help me, Obi-Wan. <laughs> I only hope. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's... absolutely. So yeah, what, what you said, well, yeah, what you what you said is right. Um, so yeah. The word hologram here is an analogy rather than uh, exactly what, what's going on. So you have when you have a hologram, you see something that looks three dimensional, but fundamentally it's just a flat piece of glass. Sure. And here the idea is that our universe, as we see it, with general relativity as our gravitational force and and uh, and the, the, the rules of how space and time relate, um, all of that is in some sense an approximation. Um, in a way you could call it an illusion. Um, and the fundamental laws of physics really live in two space and one time dimension, something something like that. So one, one fewer dimension would be the, uh, the idea there. And so somehow the, the, what, what in order for this to not be obviously wrong and, and, and obviously crazy, you have to find a, a, a two dimension, a, a system with two spatial dimensions that you can reinterpret all of the interactions and dynamics of that two-dimensional system as a three-dimensional system with the force of gravity included. And that is what the great accomplishment of this ADS CFT correspondence anti-dissider conformal field theory, um, uh, that's that's what the the that's what it achieves, is it turns out there is this thing that sounds incredibly technical called a conformal field theory. And there's this kind of space time, which is described by general relativity, but it's, it has a particular kind of curvature called anti de Sitter space. It has a kind of negative curvature. curvature. Um, it's, it's sort of like a saddle shaped universe and uh, anti de Sitter, the, the gravitational dynamics of particles and fields and, and, and strings um, and black holes in anti de Sitter space is exactly the same thing. It's the same system as uh, uh, this conformal field theory. Um, and that's very surprising and it involves a lot of uh, fascinating mathematics that it's possible for dynamics in two dimensions to be the same as dynamics in three dimensions, but that's that's what's exciting and, and, uh, and is being accomplished by this description. So has someone actually taken um, a particular field that e exists, let's say just the electromagnetic negative field, which everybody understands pretty much because they have cell phones and <laughs> all that stuff. So they kind of have an under, uh, a day-to-day -day living understanding of electromagnetism. So has someone done the math or a calculation or, or a simulation that um, takes a two-dimensional um, space and then create it Electromagnet and an, an electromagnetic field that exists in, in our three dimensional space. I mean, it would seem like that would be something you would want to do, you know, to show that this might make sense because we have all these fields permeating the space we live in. So they have to come from somewhere. And if it's holographic, you should be able to mathematically show that they can emanate from that two dimensional um, space. Yeah. So, uh, so at the level of thought experiments and computational experiments, the answer is definitely yes. Um, people, people, they're, they're, I mean, ADS CFT uh, uh, was discovered in 1997 and 1998 uh, by, by, by many people, but I mean, the very first paper was by Juan Maldacena, um, yeah. one of the greatest theoretical physicists uh, alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and so people have been thinking about it now for for 20 some years and there there are a host of different examples what you can work out in detail if you have a particle or a few particles they could be charged particles under the force of electromagnetism they can feel the force of gravity and and be orbiting each other in some way if you have if you have some some system like that we can actually give you a uh we can, we can mathematically write down a two-dimensional description of exactly that same dynamics in a conformal field theory and show that that they're the same thing that they behave in in the same way so at the level of sort of computational or thought experiments it's 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 very uh very well established but we certainly don't have any kind of physical experiments in our universe where an experimentalist goes and measures something that 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 confirms or denies this and i mean it should be noted that this version of holography we i mean it's 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 generally believed that holography is a very general principle, this, I, this general idea of lower and higher dimensional systems being related. Um, but uh, the, uh, this, this specific realization of it doesn't apply to our universe. We live in an accelerating, expanding cosmology. And this really applies to a universe that's more, uh, that you'd think of as being more static and actually has kind of the opposite kind of curvature as, as our universe. So we haven't yet really been able to use this to satisfyingly address any fundamental questions about our particular universe, like questions like what happened at the Big Bang? What was the initial singularity of our universe? What is the far future of our universe? What's that gonna be like? This is something that people have thought about a lot, but we don't really know how to uh, apply these ideas to, to answer those deep questions yet. And that's, that's why people are still working. Well, that's interesting. So you started off um, giving us an understanding about this, talking about how physics, um, some physics and theories have within itself its own destruction. And you can think about the original model of the atom, which was this, you know, uh, electrons orbiting a, a nucleus, uh, like planets orbiting the sun. And soon it was found out that that's just like, no. Uh, the electrons would crash into the nucleus and uh, we would have a destroy, our model would be destroyed. I'm bringing it up because, um, of course, that led to a more sophisticated understanding of uh, the atom and a quantum mechanical understanding, as you mentioned earlier, of uh, the electron and how the electron uh, works. And uh, that was a huge you know, breakthrough. So, but what I'm not seeing or hearing in this explanation of quantum mechanics breaking down or having with it within it its own destruction, um, even though you've gotten to this notion about uh, a holographic universe, it doesn't seem to be on the same level as understanding the atom in a in a quantum sense. There seems to be just this huge gap, you know, between. Um, you know, the theory and, and anything that might be real or measurable or, or understanding from a laboratory sense. Yeah, no, I think that's just absolutely true. So uh, um, I think physics and theoretical physics is both a beneficiary and a victim of its own success. So um, it's, uh, I mean, it's basically very, very difficult. I mean, you might say impossible to find any experiment that can't be explained using uh, uh, using the standard model of particle physics, and 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 I would include in that general relativity. Um, there aren't any experiments that 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 really show major violations of this. There are some loose ends, and a lot of them are interesting, important loose ends. But uh, but a lot of those theories work very 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 well. So mm -hmm. that's a, a blessing and a curse. Um, I think it's a uh, 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 it's a curse because it means that. These questions about quantum gravity, while uh, very deep, um, are not very relevant for, uh, for, for, for upcoming experiments. There are some kind of ideas out of left field where maybe they, they would be um, uh, uh, in a couple of different ways that might be surprising. But basically, I think it's, it's very, very far, far afield. Now, I think there's this uh, underlying question, which is, um, to what extent is progress in science driven by experiment versus by theory? Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, generally speaking, I think experiment, I think basically nature is smarter than we are. And so uh, experiment is, is, is crucial. I think the, uh, the thing that gives theoretical physicists a lot of excuses is that it really depends on the sort of age and level of development 
of the, the scientific field. So, uh, I mean, people have been doing physics for, for, for 400 years or more, I mean, depending on, on what you count. And uh, uh, that means that we have an incredible wealth of information about all sorts of different constraints. I mean, we have predictions from the standard model that go out to 10 decimal places that are correct. Um, and so there's a huge, huge number of different constraints. And the theories we currently have, like the standard model and general relativity, are, have been tested extremely well. And they're themselves very complicated, sophisticated theories with a lot of different pieces that have to fit together perfectly and, and do. Um, and I mean, that's why it takes a long time to, uh, uh, to study physics in college and grad school and become a, a working physicist, because you have to absorb all of this knowledge and all of the implications and constraints uh, that, that it implies, because all of those constraints say that a lot of ideas that might sound good um, at first are, are really just sort of wrong in, in an obvious or not obvious way because of existing knowledge. So mm -hmm. I think it's the incredible level of constraints from all of the things that we've, we've done so far and the, the precision and detail with which we understand physical theories like quantum field theory built on quantum mechanics and then the standard model being an example of, of a quantum field theory. There's, there's all this, uh, there, there are all these different components. And so I think the reason why it's possible for theorists to do uh, speculative theory work and not be completely wasting their time is because uh, if you come up with a theory, it's so constrained by what we already know that there isn't a lot of wiggle room. And so you can really, uh, you can really test your ideas very, very, very quickly. And so when, when like uh, autodidactic uh, lay people sort of like read a physics book and say, oh, I know, I have this theory of the, the proton, it's really this kind of vortex and it has this kind of feature and, <laughs> and whatnot. I think those kinds of things, uh, and I mean, physicists get letters from, from people who come up with such theories all the time. Um, those things are almost always wrong in some very basic reason because they conflict with with all of these all of these constraints. Are, so I think that's that's why it's it's not crazy to do theory work, but uh, but but who knows? Well, that's a good segue for me to ask you this, and we're just about out of time. And and I appreciate you know you spending so much time to to explain some of these things. Um, you also work on GTP three, um, you know, which is uh, AI and uh, artificial intelligence and a way of, uh, well, for our listeners who don't understand GTP3 or, or what we're talking about here, um, when you put in a, um, um, when you're typing on your computer, for example, in Gmail and Gmail completes a sentence for you, for example, and uh, anticipates what you're going to say um, that's a lower level, maybe first generation form of what we're talking about with GTP and, uh, and a type of artificial in intelligence. So now, um, in this artificial intelligence that we're talking about, we're talking about, it's incomprehensible to me, you know, data sets that are in the billions or trillions or quadrillions <laughs> or something that goes into this AI and allows them to complete, uh, different things and to give us our listeners are uh, an understanding. For example, you can say in common language, um, and this is something that you'll find on the internet, uh, that my uh, landlord won't come and fix the, the radiator and um, can I legally withhold the rent and I wanna you know, write a legal document that says that. And you can say that in plain English and this AI will actually put that uh, in legal uh, language uh, for you. It can also create music, and it's also now writing, as I understand it, um, computer code um, as well, something you've been working on, and that a lot has to do with neural net. So can you just say a few words about that and um, how physicists come, come at that and help create that, that kind of artificial intelligence? Yeah, so it's, it's, you, you described it beautifully. Um, it, uh, it read something like, 200 billion words of text. Um, there's way more than that out on the internet. So uh, it read something like 200 billion words of text. And through that, through all of the patterns in that text, because it doesn't know anything about the world except what it learned uh, from, from that process, it's able to, uh, to then 
right to generate uh, generate seemingly uh, impressive impressive text through the correlations that it understood um, in its training process. Uh, uh. And so, I mean, I came to work on this. I mean, mostly just because I, I, uh, I mean, I guess at a very fundamental level, maybe two of the most interesting questions you can ask are: what are the, what is the universe and uh, what is intelligence? What is the mind? Uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I think uh, uh, another perspective on this also is that what we can actually do with intelligence is almost in itself kind of a, a feature of our universe. It's not a law of physics, but uh, but the fact that certain kinds of algorithms are uh, are possible to execute in a reasonable amount of time and others aren't, I think is actually kind of an interesting feature. Um, there's a way that any of us could beat Shakespeare. We could write every possible book that could ever exist. And then we could just read all of them and go through and pick out the ones that were, were as good or better than Shakespeare. And if we had good judgment, all we would need is good judgment and we could do that. But that's obviously a ridiculous idea because all of the books that could ever be written um, are completely computationally infeasible to, to construct or write. And so that's sort of a silly example, but sort of points to this idea that what kinds of things we can and can't do in terms of processing information um, really kind of fundamentally constrains uh, constrains what's, what's possible. Um, so those are some super abstract philosophical reasons uh, mm -hmm. uh, to care. Mostly I care because I think there's been really dramatic progress uh, in AI using neural networks in the last 10 years. Um, and I expect that that's gonna continue. And I think a perspective that I as a physicist have on this is that <clears throat> there are actually scaling laws in AI. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is something that I worked on directly and it helped inspire GPT-3. Um, so if you look at sort of how smart a program that's writing is, um, and you look at how smart it is as a function of how much data it reads. We talked about 200 billion words, but it could have been 20 billion words or 2 billion words, et cetera. If you look at how smart it gets as a function of how much data it has and how big the neural network is, how big its brain is, then it turns out there are actually very precise scaling laws. They're actually very reminiscent of things like thermodynamics um, in the sense that these networks are so big and the data sets are so big that there's a kind of law of large numbers that when you when you try to optimize their performance, you get some consistent predictable result. And so I think that's a perspective that is very much the way that a physicist would think about a system, just sort of look at how what happens when you change certain parameters and then try to formulate a, a precise uh, kind of law of nature, like a, a mathematical formula that tells you uh, what changes as you change these inputs, like the amount of data or, or how big the neural network is. Um, when, you say, when you say neural network, I want our listeners to understand we're, we're talking about um, analogous to the neural connections uh, between synapses in our, in our brain, and there are trillions of them. And so you're in an analogous way, we're talking about uh, these neural networks in, in AI being uh, comparable to the brain and the connections uh, that are made. And so the more data, as we were saying, whether it's 200 billion, you know, words of text or whatever it is, represent all these different connections. And when you say there are scaling laws, you're talking about after something gets to a certain point of connections or you get a certain amount of data, then you can predict that there's gonna be um, a certain um, level and to, to use this word, I, I think it would be correct to use the word intelligence um, emerges. Um, exactly, exactly. So laws that go that. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So yeah, these are artificial neural networks uh, that are being run on uh, on big clusters of, of computers, and uh, and it's exactly exactly what you said. Um, uh, as you either make these neural networks bigger, um, or you increase the amount of data, and there are various different uh, ways you can you can combine these things. Um, there's a predictable sense in which the intelligence of this system uh, improves, and and I mean you can quantify that very straightforwardly. So for example, in our uh, GBD3 paper, um, you can look at the SATs. These the SATs are this test that American high school students take to get into college. And they're analogy, they're, they're, there are various word problems in the SATs, they're analogies. And you can ask how well uh, does this neural net do at answering SAT questions? 
could it get into college in the US or not? And, uh, and the answer is um, uh, the, the most recent model on some of these questions, even though it didn't specifically, it wasn't taught to do the SATs, it just read, it's an autodidact, it read everything on the internet in, in some sense. Um, it learned, it, 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 the, the largest model was actually better than the average American high school student at, at, at these uh, multiple choice questions. And, uh, and you can also see that there's this steady improvement. So if you take, if you take models that have less data or that, are, that have smaller networks, um, they don't do as well, but there's kind of a steady predictable scaling of uh, how, how intelligent these, uh, these networks are um, as, uh, as you increase uh, these inputs. And I think this is one of the many reasons why I don't think that this whole neural network AI deep learning field is sort of overhyped. Um, I think there are these predictable trends which indicate that we're really going to be able to make even more intelligent systems uh, in the relatively near future. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mentioned to you uh, in our early, you know, correspondence, and um, and I, I wasn't sure if you were responding to this part of what I was saying or not. <laughs> but you know, can uh, you know, in, in AI with this technology, with this GTP technology, you know, does this really lead to some sort of, um, you know, sophisticated AI mind? Um, because this this uh, technology, these and the algorithms that you employ um, to run the system, it's self learning. So this is machine learning that's actually self learning. Uh, after a point, you're not putting any more input in. It's actually using um, the input that it has and going through it constantly and learning from what it has already uh, generated. Is that correct? Yeah, that's 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 all correct. It's it's what. People often call this unsupervised learning because we just give the model all this, all this data, all of these words, all of these web pages and essays and books downloaded from the internet, and it just reads them and learns, and we just sit back and watch. Um, so, so that's absolutely true. Um, whether or not what kind of learning this is, whether or not it's achieving some notion of true intelligence or true understanding, um, is fairly controversial. There are a lot of people with different opinions. Um, I tend to be fairly uh, uh, kind of optimistic on the side that it, it sort of really is learning a lot of uh, subtle, important features of, uh, of the world and, 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 and how to think about it. And I think sort of combining this with other, other learning techniques that maybe are more specific, more aimed at actually uh, uh, doing a specific task, I think, uh, I think we will have models that really do kind of understand and really do uh, 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 and really can kind of kind of think in, in, in at least in all external respects. I mean, uh, I mean, like you see a duck and you call it a duck because it looks like a duck. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, similarly here, if you have something that's capable of doing all of these different things, I, once that that we associate with human intelligence, then I, I think I would sort of give it the benefit of the doubt, um, and uh, uh, and 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 imagine that it actually does have some model of the world that means that it understands the world and, and is sort of making predictions and uh, and doing tasks uh, uh, based on that model. So coming full circle on that with uh, with physics, uh, do you think that uh, you can take this? Uh, uh, AI and apply it to some of the deep questions of, of physics, feed it a bunch of, you know, data and the questions we're talking about, because it wouldn't come to it with some of the prejudices that physicists come at it with, you know, it would be like, totally, I don't care what the answer is, as long as it's right. <laughs> so is, do you think it's possible? Yeah, I actually do think it's possible. Um, I don't think that it's going to happen super very, very soon, but yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, look, I mean, uh, humans seem like we're very dominant as a species on, 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 on the planet because we're intelligent and because we are able to work together and preserve knowledge um, uh, within our civilizations and pass it on to, to our children. Um, and, but there's a whole spectrum of intelligence. There's, uh, uh, I mean, there's paramecium, there are mice, there are dogs, there's, there's dolphins and us. And I don't think that we're, there's no sense in which that continuum of, of sort of intelligence, um, of course, I'm oversimplifying a lot by calling it a continuum. I mean, all these different species have different skills, but anyway, there's there's no reason to imagine that 
you can't have a, a creature um, or, or an AI system that is much more intelligent than, than we are, um, and therefore would be much better at understanding laws of physics than we are. And I, I do think that that is uh, uh, achievable. One of the benefits of being a physicist is that the field of artificial intelligence research uh, is, uh, is very traumatized. There was this idea in the sort of 60s and 70s that they were going to be able to build systems that were smarter than people in just six months or a year. And I'm not even really sure that very many people believe that or, or claimed it uh, that widely. But anyway, it has this reputation that a, the field of AI overclaimed. They said that they were going to make tremendous progress and then they failed and there was this AI winter. And so people in, our, in the AI field, I think, are very reticent to make any kind of ambitious claim because they're afraid of being accused of just uh, 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 kind of crying wolf. And uh, as a physicist, I don't really have any of that kind of collective trauma. Um, I, I'm just sort of cook, coming at it from fresh with fresh eyes. And it really just seems like there's going to be a trend of, of, of significant improved performance uh, in intelligence uh, in, the, in the sort of foreseeable future. Well, Dr. Kaplan, thank you. I mean, this has just been absolutely fascinating. I, I could talk to you into the into the uh, midnight hours about all of this stuff, uh, but I know you have better things to do than to talk to me for uh, eight hours about this, but I certainly appreciate the hour uh, you've spent with us uh, sharing your knowledge on, on these subjects. And uh, would you come back again and talk about fields? Um, <laughs> sure, sure. I would be happy to come back. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, thanks for all the questions and for having me. Um, yeah. It's a great program. Well, um, you have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving uh, with your family, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Wow, what a great discussion. I sure hope you all enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about the concepts we discussed on the program today, like anti de Sitter space or conformal field theory, or the latest advances in artificial intelligence, you can go to our website at lifeisastorypodcast.com. Our next podcast will take a retrospective look at the discovery of the Higgs boson, or more accurately, the Higgs field, and ask whether its discovery has contributed to our understanding of reality. So, remember to stay safe, share happiness, and never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing.